Well, I wish I had more time to talk about the emperors who succeeded Augustus, with the partial exception of Claudius. They range from cruel and tyrannical to cruel, tyrannical, and totally nuts. They also, unlike Augustus, made no effort to disguise their new role as emperors or the demise of the Republic. Caligula famously made his beloved horse a priest, and though this is more than likely a legend, threatened to make him consul. He certainly killed off most of his relatives. All of these emperors spent lavishly on their personal homes. When much of Rome burnt down in a fire during the reign of Nero, it was rebuilt mostly in more fireproof concrete. We'll see some of the wonderful results before long, but this slide shows the spectacular home that Nero had built for himself. The most famous room is the domed octagonal hall built of concrete with a stucco veneer and gilded with lots of precious gold. Architects were beginning to realize the potential of concrete to open up space and to move beyond rectilinear lines. In 68 CE, the deeply unpopular Nero committed suicide. Out of the ensuing civil war, the commander of the Eastern Army's Vespasian, or Flavius to give his family name, emerged victorious. Vespasian would be succeeded by his son Titus. Vespasian and Titus had made a point of turning away from the private enrichment of Augustus's successors, especially Nero. Instead, they embarked on a huge public building program, which included most famously the Colosseum. Domitian ruled for more than 15 years and continued the massive building program. He also further expanded the boundaries of the empire, but he was tyrannical and very unpopular with the Senate, which had him assassinated. For our purposes, all you really need to remember about the Flavian dynasty is that they constructed perhaps the most iconic of Roman buildings, the Colosseum, and that's where we'll turn now. Let's start with a video clip that gives a clear picture of the function of this Roman architectural triumph. Sorry, I know this one's a little long, but it's very informative. The Colosseum was constructed of barrel vaulted corridors that held up a huge oval seating area the size of a 16 story building with seating for 50 to 80,000 spectators. The outer shell was covered by travertine, a kind of limestone, but the huge building was made possible only by the magic of concrete. The decorative scheme, as you see on the bottom left, had engaged columns bracketing arches. The column order changed with the stories. Tuscan on the first level, then Doric, then Ionic, and finally Corinthian. You see the biggest, sturdiest column, Tuscan, on the bottom right. Next to it are the brackets that held the Valerium or sunshade. But to really understand the Colosseum, you have to grasp the two incredibly important Roman innovations that made it possible, the arch and concrete. Let's watch a clip from a rather old but good video series entitled Art of the Western World. As you learn from your homework, these, the higher class seats were at the bottom. The poor women and slaves were relegated to the nosebleed seats. And here's a diagram that shows the lower levels where the wild beasts were caged. And here are several views of the interior, including the tunnels and rooms under the arena. This is not a required work, but I wanted to show a triumphal arch both because this is a famous element of Roman architecture and because this particular arch captures an extremely important moment in Jewish history, Titus's conquest of Jerusalem. As a reminder, engaged columns are not freestanding but attached to walls. We saw engaged columns on the Colosseum too. This is a famous image and one that used to show up on AP tests all the time. What we are seeing here is the Romans removing the treasure from the temple in Jerusalem, including the unmistakable menorah candelabrum. This is significant for the Colosseum because it was funds from this conquest from the temple of Jerusalem that essentially paid for the Colosseum. Well, you may have run out of time, but if not, let's take a few minutes to look at a past AP question about the Colosseum. In my introduction to the AP exam essays, I mentioned that two of your essays would involve images that are not in our required work set. One of these will be an attribution essay, where basically you attribute a work to the culture or artist that created it based on its similarity to something that is on a required works list. We will cover attribution in depth in Unit 5 and again in Unit 12, so you should just consider this a trailer. 
I think my students were pretty pleased to see this question emerge, and I trust that you all recognize the similarity to the Coliseum. I've screenshot the identifiers that the ECB will accept. Remember that you need two to get the point. Still, this one's pretty easy. Note that you don't need to know that this was the Roman arena at Nimes. Why should you? It's not on the list. Here's an example of where you do need to read the question carefully. It asks you to give both visual and contextual evidence. That means two points, one for each kind of evidence. Here is the visual evidence listed in the scoring guidelines. Note that you can pretty much assume in an attribution question that what is true of the required work is true of the attributed work as well. And the same turns out to be true for contextual evidence. You can assume the same kind of shenanigans that went on in Nîmes went on in Rome and for the same political and cultural reasons. Here again, you need to read the question carefully. In your answer, you have to talk about both materials and building techniques, a point for each. Here are proposed answers to materials. No surprise, we see a lot of focus on concrete. And for building methods, again, we see a focus on surprise, surprise, arches. You've got